Welcome family and friends to Sparkle Storytime. Today I'll be reading Star Wars Myths and Fables The Night in the Dragon by George Mann. There was once a tribe of nomadic people on the distant dusty planet of Tatum who for many months had been terrorized by a fearsome dragon. These were a simple people with simple needs who had for generations eked out an uncomplicated existence on the harsh desert sands, trading with other tribes for water and sustenance, salvaging the wreckage left behind by those careless few who shared their world. Those others who li- whose lives unfolded in the noisy cities and spaceports, who tried ineffectively to hold back the sand rather than embrace its gifts. The desert folk had little cause to visit these teeming cities. However, and although they had once roamed the rolling dunes and great caverns, they had found a place to settle. They were at one with the land and knew that the desert itself would provide them with everything they might need. So it was that these sand people came to establish a village of their own, a place they might call home. For many months the village flourished and food and water proved bountiful as the desert offered up its gifts. The villagers, once so used to their endless migration across the sands, grew complacent and comfortable. Yet, in their ignorance, they knew not that they had awoken the wrath of a great dragon, Christ, that made its nest amongst the nearby dunes and called that domain its own. Christ was sly and knew that the people of the sands were in no way its equal in battle or cunning, so it devised a plan to rid itself of them. Just as the desert had provided for the villagers, it would provide too for the dragon. The people of the sand were numerous, and the dragon ever hungry. If it ration them carefully, the villagers would sustain it for many months to come. Soon enough, it would reclaim its domain from the interlopers once they were all inside its belly. But dragons are long-lived and lazy, and Christ saw no need to hurry. Thus, it chose to begin with the villagers' plump livestock which they held in large corrals on the outskirts of the village. Only then, when the entire herd had been consumed, would the dragon enjoy the taste of that which it so craved, people. Thus began a campaign of nightly terror as the dragon, so large that the beat of its wings alone was enough to stir the sand into great storms that ravaged the villagers' tents, descended upon the village to snatch at the mewling beast in their pens before hurrying away back to its sandy lair to feast. The villagers crowded at the mere, cowered at the mere sight of such a terrible beast, and in their fear they made no move to try to prevent the dragon's attacks. On the fifth day, however, the villagers were growing desperate, for they knew that if the dragon continued, soon there would be no livestock left in the pens to feed their children. That night, ten of the villagers' most trusted warriors took up their arms and went to stand guard over the pens in the belief that, together, they might prove strong enough to scare the beast into fleeing or even to slay it. 
As it had each night before, the dragon came with the setting suns, a vast and horrifying silhouette, stark against the reddening sky. On huge wings it soared, sweeping low over the heads of the villagers, wheeling above them as they raised their weapons and took aim. Yet their weapons were ineffective and did not so much as scratch the beast. Far from dissuaded, it bruised the villagers aside with a flick of its wing and once more sailed away into the night with a squealing animal for its supper. In such a way, it continued for many days until the villagers' livestock had all been consumed. And the sand people themselves lived in fear of what the dragon Krites might do when it returned to discover the pens empty. Krite, though, had planned for such an eventuality and had secretly willed that day to come. Because to a dragon, there is no sweeter meal than a helpless villager. That night, the dragon returned to the village to find the livestock pens had been abandoned. With a crackle of malicious glee, it turned to the village and beat its wings until the tents were swept away in a blizzard of sand and the people cowering beneath were relieved. For a moment, the dragon seemed to linger and then, licking its lips, it selected a young boy whom it plucked up from its mother's arms and carried away into the night. The boy was not the last of his peers to be lost in such a fashion. The crite soon developed quite a taste for children. The villagers took to hiding their young in pits beneath the shifting sands, but the dragon was wise and had seen such tricks before. It dug up the children like wriggling worms, went to feast upon each night. The villagers could stand for this no longer and elected a warrior from amongst their number, whom they armed with their most precious weapons, adorned with their strongest armor, and sent out into the desert to stir the dragon from its nest. This warrior carried vengeance in her heart, for she knew the dragon must pay for the lives it had stolen and she boldly claimed that she would soon return with the beast's head as a trophy of her victory. The villagers cheered as she strode off toward the horizon, and in their hearts, for the first time in months, they carried hope for the future. That evening, the dragon did not return to the village. Cautious words of optimism were whispered around hearthstones as the villagers enjoyed their first night of peace for some time. And with the dawn, all agreed that the warrior must have been successful, and only in the only reason she had not yet returned was that she bore the weight of the dragon's head on her return journey. Collectively, they sighed in relief and believed that the nightmare of their plight was over. Yet evening rolled around again and still the warrior had not returned. Optimism once again gave way to creeping fear and soon enough as the sun dipped out of sight the dragon appeared on the horizon and the villagers realized that all they had achieved in dispatching the warrior was to save the dragon the trouble of coming to the village for the previous evening's meal. The campaign of terror began anew. So it was that, in desperation, the villagers concocted another plan. Certain that the dragon would not be dissuaded and would keep on returning until every last one of them had been gobbled up, 
the villagers agreed that they must find an alternative form of sustenance to offer the dragon. The next day, a small band of villagers set across out across the sands to where they knew a traveling band of fellow desert folk had temporarily made their camp. It did not please the villagers to lay siege to their own kin, but the dragon had left them with little choice. So the camp was hurriedly raided and the livestock stolen. It was a small herd, but it would buy them time. So the livestock were driven back to the village and pinned in the corral, ready for the dragon's return that night. True to what had gone before, the dragon came with the setting of the suns but showed little interest in the livestock for it had enjoyed the taste of people and the livestock would never again satisfy its hunger. The villagers wailed as they plucked another one of their number from the stand for soon, like the livestock, there would be none of them left and their plan to distract the dragon had failed. There was only one request left to them. If the dragon wanted people, then people they would give it. Yet, they would no longer allow the dragon to take from amongst their own, for they had already lost too many. Nor would they be driven from their newfound home, for the desert had accepted them, and the months before the coming of the dragon had been the happiest they had known. Thus, the raiding party that had set out the previous day did so again, only this time they had a different quarry in mind. It was two days before they returned, and they were pained by the knowledge of what those two days meant, that Kreitz would have paid two more visits to the village in their absence. Two more of their people would have been lost. And yet, upon their return, they were welcomed as heroes, for they had brought with them seven humans captured on the outskirts of the nearest town and marched along the winding paths through the dunes. Most of the livestock corals were empty, so the captives were herded into one such pen and bound and upon the setting of the suns. One of them was chosen and tied to a stake outside the village boundary as an offering to Christ. At first, the dragon seemed unsure of the new development, perhaps su suspicious of the villagers' intent, lest they meant to poison it. In truth, a thought that had not occurred to villagers so desperate were they to save themselves. The dragon had, however, a most delicate sense of smell and was soon to, to discern that the offering was fresh and juicy and wriggled just as well as all the others Krite had plucked from amongst the villagers. The villagers were overjoyed for the dragon had been stated and their plan had worked. For the next three nights, they continued in such a fashion, selecting one of the captives, pinning the sacrifice out to the village boundary, and going about their business while the dragon feasted. More raiding parties were raised, and future excursions to the nearest city yielded yet more captives. A solution had been found, and the people of the sand could once more go about their lives, assured that they had settled upon a means to appease the dragon. Yet once again, the villagers had not counted on their actions invoking the wrath of another. An old knight who had once been regarded as a mighty hero had made his home on the desert world, where he had long before been tasked with protecting a most particular treasure. The knight was retired from adventuring, and much like the desert people, he shunned the company of others, preferring a life of solitude and quiet contemplation 
while he went about his final duty. Nevertheless, the old knight was of an altruistic disposition, and upon hearing that people were being taken from the nearby town, he felt compelled to investigate. The knight soon discovered the perpetrators behind the disappearances, for the desert folk were not such on their captive of the sacrifices, and still stealthy from years traversing the galaxy following the raiding party back to the outskirts of the desert village. There the old knight learned the truth, that the villagers were acting in desperation to protect themselves from the dragon Christ. Still, while he felt great sympathy for the villagers and all they had suffered, he could not allow such a thing to stand. The old knight had not been not seen battle for many years and had long before been discarded his armor in favor of simple robes. All the better to conceal his true identity from the many enemies who might yet seek him out on the backwater world. So it was that, upon descending from the dunes to enter the village, the old knight was derided by the villagers, who challenged him and bound him and tossed him into the pen, along with the other townsfolk they had captured. For the villagers were blind to the truth, and could not see that the old knight still harbored a great and terrible strength in his weary bones. He would, they decided, serve as another sacrifice to the great dragon Christ, despite his advanced age and tough, leathery flesh. In his wisdom, the old knight played along with the villagers' games, and so pinned amongst the other captives, and unobserved by the villagers, he shrugged off his bonnets to set to work freeing the others from within. Soon the townsfolk had fled the pen, hurrying off into the dunes toward their homes. And the old knight stood alone, satisfied with his work, and smiling. As the afternoon light began to wane, the villagers returned to choose a sacrifice from amongst the captives, but were infuriated to find only the old knight kneeling silently inside the pen, his eyes closed in peaceful meditation as he awaited his fate. While little choice lest they sacrifice one of their own, the villagers dragged the old knight to the village boundary and tied him to the stake before retreating to the safety of their tents to await the coming of the dragon. Sure enough, as day finally gave way to dust, the silhouette of the dragon, vast and ominous, appeared on the horizon, its wings unfurled stir rolling clouds of dust as it sped toward the village boundary. It circled once above the camp, eyeing the old knight, laughing at the sight of such a poor victim. Yet the old knight was wily and had once again slipped his bounds, for he had known the villagers would select him as their sacrifice, and as the dragon swooped low to pluck him from the sand, he stood and ignited his gleaming sword of light, which he raised above his head in warning, thus revealing his true nature to all who looked on. The dragon, unduly unnerved by the sudden alteration, wheeled in the sky above the village, roaring in frustration that what it had assumed to be another simple sacrifice had proved to be something altogether more complicated. Crite was an arrogant beast and knew that, despite the villagers' trickery, for surely it was they who had concealed the unlikely warrior beneath such humble robes. One man could be no match for a beast of its size and power. Crite knew that it would go not go hungry that night. 
Thus began a dance of such elegance and ferocity that the villagers all emerged from their tents to observe as dragon and knight dipped and weaved, Christ sweeping low with his whip-like tail and flashing talons, the knight ducking and leaping, the glowing blade of his sword humming through the air. He moved with a grace that belied his age, and the villagers knew at once, upon witnessing such a feat, that they had badly misjudged a man they had assumed to be a pitiful traveler from a nearby town. For an hour or more the battle continued, and yet neither the dragon nor the knight had made a mark upon the other. So eventually matched were they in wit and skill, the old knight understood that as well fed and as strong as the dragon was, he could never defeat it in battle. Indeed, his display was designed to serve an altogether different purpose, for he soon began to tire, and he sensed the dragon's glee as he faltered in his feet and stumbled on the sand. Christ smelled victory and dough, and the old knight lowered his sword of light. The villagers gasped as the dragon swooped low, claws stirring the sand, jaws yawning wide to reveal a carnivorous maw lined with angry ivory daggers, and then it stopped. The old knight had raised his hand above his head, his palm held out toward the dragon, mere centimeters from where its tapered snout hovered. The villagers held their breath. The knight had gone suddenly still. The old knight's blade flickered once, then bleaked out. Then the dragon exhaled gently, issuing a contented sigh, before lowering itself slowly to the ground, like a lost wolf pup before its mother. The dragon cried, cross-sided itself before the knight, its head coming to rest on the sand by his feet. Tentative at first, and then suddenly, rapturous, the villagers began to cheer and hoot in celebration, for they saw that the old knight had cast a spell upon the dragon to quiet its mind, and in doing so, he had finally freed them from its reign of terror. But the knight himself was not so easily placed in it because he silenced the villagers with a look more fearsome than even that of the dragon. With a gesture, he bade the dragon to rise to its full height, towering over him, glowering, glowering, glowering down at the assembled villagers. He took a step forward, and the dragon followed it in kind. Subject to his every whim, so mesmerized was it by his spell. The dragon Christ is now under my thrall, and as such will do only my bidding. No longer shall you suffer from its nightly visits. The crowd began to cheer once more, but the old knight ushered them to silence again. Yet you have wronged the people of the town, for you have taken your pain and made it theirs. This too shall cease, for if you ever raid the settlements of others, I shall learn of it and I shall re return with this dragon and your village shall be destroyed. At that the dragon stirred, spreading its wings as to underline the old knight's point. Now go in peace and return to your families and enjoy the gifts of the desert. Then the old knight turned his back on the people of the sand and slowly led the dragon away into the dusty night. The villagers never saw the old knight again or his dragon, but they remembered his warning well. Thus, unique amongst the nomadic tribes of Tatuni, the villagers never again raided the settlements of others or took captives from the cities and towns of the desert worlds. The end. Thank you for watching.